This week, we talk about the big 4-2 win over the New York Islanders and Michael Backlund's Olympic hopes, Sean Monaghan's progress so far this season, Yanni Ordio's recall from the farm, and more. Plus, we're pleased to be joined by Flames alumni Rico Fata to chat about his career, life as an NHL player, his advice for Sean Monaghan, and his Fast by Fata hockey school. All this and more coming up. This is Fireside Chat, episode 38. Rico Fata, recorded February 6th and 7th, 2014. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's Dan and Matt coming back with you, and we're right on the heels of a 4-2 win from the Flames tonight. Matt, how you feeling? Very good. Yeah? It's, it always feels good after a win, doesn't it? Oh, definitely. Especially with an effort that the Flames had tonight. Yeah, tonight against the Islanders, it was really all penalty killers, wasn't it? Pretty much. Some of those penalties are a little bogus, but, you know, the guys like Boma and that sure uh, brought their A-game. But see, that's the thing that always irks me, is when you get a bogus penalty and you can't kill it off. I mean, I'd rather see guys that are killing the penalty hard, and when we get a penalty that's perhaps unjust, we can get rid of it and go back to even strength. Yeah. Well, especially at the end of the game, that hoodler trip or hook or whatever it was, like, that was... You know, if they called that every time, there'd be about 200 penalties a game. Yeah, I know, I saw that, and I was thinking, what the heck is that? You know, one guy that I thought looked really good tonight was TJ Brody. Yeah, he and Michael Backlund have both turned it right on. And Yeah, they have. You know, Brody's starting to emerge as a legit first-pairing defenseman. Yeah, well, it was funny because Hartley was saying, I forget after which game, but one of his media scrums I was watching on the website, and he was talking about how he really thinks that Brody is a uh, first-pairing defenseman, possibly, and you know doesn't understand how good he really is and stuff like that. So, you know, the coaching staff has a lot of faith in him. Yeah. The only uh, area of weakness, per se, is uh, his offensive game, which is amusing considering he's an offensive defenseman. He doesn't seem to take as much risk as he could likely get away with. He's still a little tentative, and like that's limiting his overall offensive game. But if he like once he gets more comfortable doing it, like he could start adding a lot more points to the board. Yeah, I was gonna say I think that's probably just maturity. I think you know he's still a young defenseman, and he's probably still coming into his own and trying to figure out what kind of player he is, and the Flames want him to be. But I think that's definitely something they can coach him on. Yeah, and he is getting a lot better in his own end. Like it, you know, from even this point last year, like it's night and day, and he was good last year. Brody's had some ups and downs between this year and last year. I know there's been times he's looked phenomenal and times that he hasn't looked all that great. So I wouldn't say streaky, but I think of all of our young defensemen that we've seen, him and Russell and some of the guys that we've called up, he's probably the one that is the least consistent. But, I mean, when he's looking good, he really looks good. Yeah. And that's, you know, he's only 21 or 22. So, you know, like that comes with the territory. You don't usually see first-pairing defensemen that are awesome at that age. So... Unless you're like Drew Doughty, but that's different. <laughs> There's always an exception to the rule, right? Yeah. And defensemen generally, it's said, peak at what, 28? Yeah, something like that, 28 So we got to seven more years. I mean, if he's looking this good at 21, think of what he's going to look like in seven years when he peaks. Mm-hmm. So if the Flames can keep this guy, I think he's going to be a, a legitimate defenseman for us going forward. The game tonight was, I think we have to agree, it was exciting, especially coming off the loss in Montreal. It was great to see another win. Unfortunately, the Flames couldn't keep their win streak alive and lost to the Canadians, but it was good to see another win tonight. And even though the Flames perhaps didn't play the best game, I think that they played a good enough game to pull out the win. I don't think they got lucky in any sense of of things, do you? No, and tonight's win was all Rito Berra. The amount of saves that he made where the Islanders likely would have scored, it, you know, it, it's full marks to him. 
And even last game against Montreal, the only goal he gave up was a bit of a weird one. So Well, that was off a shin pad, I think. Yeah, so like you can't really fault him on that. So he's actually been really good since he's come in. As much as I was um, a little bit disappointed the Flames didn't start Yanni Ordeo tonight, I was glad they did start Barra because he definitely deserved it after the last game. Yeah, it, like, it, you know, Barra's still young himself. So, you know, you can't, you know, take the toy away after a performance where you only give up one goal that was off a shin pad. So, you know, it, I would have liked to see Ordeo in, but, you know, just to see him get a taste, but, you know, you can't do that with Barra. No. Well, let's talk about Ordeo. So in the game against uh, the Minnesota, you and I were both there, and... It was weird because I, I was looking away and all of a sudden um, I looked back in the net and the number on the back of the goalie had changed. Well, it was a weird play behind the net where he fell backwards awkwardly that I think did it. Yeah, and it, you know there wasn't a stoppage in play to haul him out or anything, so he was obviously okay to get out of there on his own. Yeah, well, especially with knee sprains and that, like usually you can stand on it and, you know, still go for a bit. It's just, it'll hurt. But, you know, then it swells up afterwards and you're done for a bit. <laughs> and and has it officially been said it was a knee strain? I assumed at first it was probably a groin injury. Yeah, it, uh, I believe it was a grade 2 sprain, but I'm not sure. Okay, so he'll, he'll be out until after like the Olympics. one of the injuries like that kipper got when he first arrived and like he was out for a month month and a half so it's you know it's fortunate that the olympics is coming up so you know he might only miss like five or six games in total and as soon as i heard that uh ramo had been hurt the first question i asked myself and i also posted on twitter for the show asking our fans was who do you bring up Ordeo or mcdonald and it turned out the mcdonald was hurt so yanni Ordeo was the logical guy to bring up yeah and you know it's always good for him to get practice in with nhl shooters even if he isn't going to play anytime you can get more experience at a higher level it's you know it'll never hurt your development so no i think not only the nhl shooters but even working with the nhl coaches um, working with Malarchuk and just seeing how stuff's done at this level. Mm -hmm. The only downside, I think, is Ordeo has been on a roll in Abbotsford lately, and I think by having him sit for a number of games, he might almost get into a uh, funk or lose his rhythm. Yeah, and no. Like, Abbotsford's on a roll regardless, so, yeah, like, during the Olympic break, he'll go back down and tear it up, so... And, you know, I guess it's kind of funny. The arena that he made his debut in, which was Montreal, I guess it's because the, the benches are too narrow, or not wide enough, I'm not sure, but they don't even have the backup goalie for the away team sitting on the bench. He has to sit in the tunnel. Yeah. So the first first game he's in, and he's not even getting to watch the game. He's sitting all by himself in the tunnel. Poor Ordeo. <laughs> I know. Do you think that we will see him play a game before the Olympic break? Do you think we'll see him play against the Flyers? Uh, with how Barra played tonight, I still would probably go with him just because, you know, he did finally get his first regulation win and all that. So, you know, either way, you know, like, it, you can't really complain with either option. So, you know, it's up to Hartley. Yeah, and it's not like um, Ordeo is going to sit around during the Olympic break doing nothing. He'll be sent back to the farm. Yeah, and, you know, Ramo, he probably will be out for a week or so afterwards, after the break, so maybe he gets a game in then. Yeah, or who knows, if McDonald's healthy then, maybe they bring him back up. If he's still around here, who knows? Yeah, I guess he would be around because there's a trade freeze, but... Yeah, I, I think it's definitely possible. I think if, after the break... Rito Barra is going to the Olympics, so it's very possible that he could be tired when he gets back. So maybe you see Ordeo start for a game or two after the Olympics to relieve Barra. Well, I don't think Barra will get too many starts. That's true, but, but even just know, the, the time difference so. and the jet lag of going back and forth to Russia. 
you know, we play pretty much right after the sure. Olympic break, I think, like the first day back. So depending on how far his team goes. But yeah, I think it'd be nice to see Ordeo get a start and let the Flames see what they've got there. And just as a transactional note, because Ordeo did get brought up to Calgary, that means that Olivier Waugh, who we acquired in the Ladislav Smee deal with Edmonton earlier, has been brought up from Alaska of the ECHL to Abbotsford. So he's now playing in Abbotsford in Ordeo's absence. So the Flames will get to see what they have in him as well. Yeah. And in the first game that he played for them, they won 7-1. Wow. How much of that is is uh, Wah? Who knows? Because like you said, they are on a tear right now, but it's always good to get some confidence and be backstopping a big win. So Matt, I wanted to chat with you today about um, Michael Backlund as well. And the rumor going around right now is that Michael Backlund has been named to the Swedish Olympic team to replace Henrik Sedin, though tonight after the Flames game, he denied it. I, I think he's looked great all season. I think that, you know, you, all things considering with where the Flames are and what their team is this year, I think that Backlund stepped up. He's played a hard game. He's uh, been a contributing member of this team. And I think going to the Olympics could really help him. If you look at the kind of guys he'd probably be playing with, I think it could really help his development and his game this year. And especially lately, Backlund's starting to look a lot better offensively as well. Like, he's always been a really good, responsible defensive forward. And, you know, over the past few weeks, we're starting to see him take more offensive risks. You know, and that's led to quite a few goals and, you know, a nice assist tonight and an empty netter. So, I you know. I think, you know, when I'm thinking about Backlund's play this year, I guess to me the phrase I would probably use is comfort. He seems like he's finally comfortable playing the NHL game at the NHL level as a, you know, as, I guess as top player on this team. Last year he, he always seemed kind of uncomfortable and like he didn't really – know his role and all that. So I think it's just maybe a comfort thing this year. But Swedish players, for some reason, they always seem to take till they're 24 to figure it out, which is quite weird. Like, all of Marcus Naslin, the Sedins, and Zetterberg, like, they were all... They were decent until they hit 24, and then they turned it on. So, you know... Maybe Backlund's just falling in that mold of, you know, not going to likely hit their level, but, you know, it just emerging. I think, too, if you look at the coaching staff this year, last year, Hartley has a much better record of helping along European players than uh, Sutter did. So, I, you know, if you look at him when he was with Colorado and even when he was with Atlanta, I think he has more patience and more understanding of different styles of the game so that might help too with the coaching staff being the way it is that Backlund's feeling more comfortable well it's good for him you know it's nice to see him you know getting a legitimate shot and you know actually picking the ball up and running with it instead of waffling a bit so yeah well I know there's some people last year that were kind of skeptical if Michael Backlund would turn out to be the NHL player we all thought he would and I know it's only one season, but based on this season, I'm pretty confident that Michael Backlund is going to be a pinnacle player for the Flames for a number of years. Yeah. He's one of those guys that he is not going to be the star guy on your team, but he's going to be one of those depth, pain-in-the-ass type players that just, you know, does everything necessary and the right way. Yeah, I don't even know if I'd necessarily call him a depth guy. I think he'll probably be a line two forward most of his career. Guy who could jump up to line one in injury trouble. Yeah, I'm thinking more like second, third line forward on a contender. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he'll definitely have a place and he'll definitely have a, a role. Yeah, somebody that you can throw out there. He knows what he's doing and how to do it and... You know, you don't have to worry about him at all. Yeah, I don't think Michael Backlund will ever become one of these guys that we see in the NHL, these, you know, dime a dozen, third, fourth line, just names, guys that you can sign any one of them and they'll fit that role. I think he's always going to have a unique kind of niche on a team and a unique playing style and a guy who will be sought after, be it from the Flames or from other people. 
But yeah, it, he may not be a first line guy, but I definitely think that he will be a core top six guy. Well, the player I always compared him to was like a poor man's version of Alex Steen. You know, like the difference between them is that Steen obviously has a better shot and then slightly better offensive abilities, but you know, like that all encompassing good at everything yeah. style of game. Yeah, that's know, probably a the, good comparison. Yeah, not this year's Alex Steen, though. Like, no, the, but not it, the 25 goals already. No, but it, if you look at the historical kind of Alex Steen throughout history, and that is something that about Steen is he's very much an all around player. Mm. And I think Backlund is getting there and can develop into that further. He could be, you know, a, a good scorer. He could be a good defensive forward. I think that there's a lot of potential there to for the Flames to kind of mold Backlund however they see fit. Mm-hmm. Another guy I thought uh, we could chat about this week, we've been doing some mid-season reviews so far, and we've talked about um, which players we thought were doing well, which players we thought weren't. Last week we looked at a mid-season review of the coaching staff. But what if we do a mid-season review of perhaps the most uh, the guy who has the spotlight on the most this year, and that's the Flames rookie and the highest overall draft pick ever by this organization, Sean Monahan. How do you think Monty's looking so far this season? Eh, he'll do. <laughs> that's it. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you're gonna have a franchise player, I guess he'll fit the mold. You know, uh, for for a guy who is making his rookie season. Um, in a tough spot for the Flames, in a big media town, a town that was, you know, hungry for a new star after Jerome left. I think the Monty's had a great season. If I remember correctly, he's now the uh, scoring leader on the team this season. Mm -hmm. And to me, every time I look at him, I mean, sure, he has setbacks, as any young player does, even older players, but he always seems like he's learning something. He always seems like he's, you know, adjusting his game based on what's going on out there. He doesn't seem like a guy who's riding high on, I'm, you know, the first overall pick and I'm awesome and, you know, don't kind of tell me what to do. I know this game already. He seems like a guy who wants to be coached. He seems like a guy who wants to be here and play and help the Flames out. Yeah. And, you know, he is getting better. Like, the only time he looked the bad per se was when uh he was just getting back off of off his, his injury ankle injury and for a little while there but you know that's understandable with foot injuries like i've seen other players in seasons past and it usually takes them a couple of weeks just to get everything back in order yeah and especially as a young guy um you know he has to learn how to probably come out of a come out of an injury correctly and how to maybe condition himself better so you know he doesn't have that. I'm not sure what it takes, but I'm sure that there's a knack there to coming back from an injury. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, and you were saying before we went on the air tonight that uh, Hartley said that he wants to put Monaghan out as the first-line center for the rest of the season against all the big lines of our opponents. Yeah, it, that's following the Olympic break. It, during the Sportsnet telecast, they, he meant Rob Kerr mentioned that, and it's just to allow Monahan to understand for next season and beyond what it'll take for him to actually be the guy. So I think it's know. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, and so do I, because. He's got to learn somehow, sometime to be the guy. So And why not do it this season when we're not expecting a lot of results anyways? I mean, if it doesn't work out, it's not like he's cost us a playoff spot or anything. Yeah, exactly. There's no pressure, so even if he does make mistakes, it's not, not really a big deal. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's a great spot for him, and who knows who his line mates will be after the trade deadline in the Olympics, but I think that'll be a good spot for him. I think it'll give him some confidence. I think it'll be a, a good for his development. Most definitely. Now, we have a two-week break coming up. If you were the Flames uh, brass, would you send him or anyone else down to Abbotsford to get some more time, or would you just let them have a rest? Uh, well, Monaghan can't go down. All oh, right, yeah, he's too young. Because he's too young. But, um, I, you know, it, it depends. Like, if they're wanting, I think Brody's the only guy that might be eligible for that without having to go through waivers. 
you might see him go down for the break. But, you know, I, yeah, I wouldn't really bother with that beyond that. So I think with, you know, the season condensed as much as it is during a Olympic season, because they missed the two weeks, I think you need to give your guys that time to rest, too. Yeah. Like, the only other guys that I could see going down are, um, like, any of the, you know, non-regulars, like Byron yeah. and Breen. Yeah, I have a feeling Breen will probably be sent back down. Byron will probably be sent back down, just because those guys came from there. Um, Blair Jones will probably be sent back down. All the guys that we've called up, and Ben Street, who I believe is still here, will probably get sent back down as well. Yeah. Basically, any of the non-important people just go. Yeah, oh, and, and Ordeo will probably get sent back down, just because they want him to play. Yep, yeah, got to make habits for the contending team in the AHL. So. Well, that's it. They're making a run for the Calder Cup, and I figure, hey, if you want to make a run for it and you've got the talent, we might as well support them however we can. Yep. It's not like the Flames are making a run up here, so let's help Abbotsford however we can. So it's uh, Thursday night, late Thursday night as we're recording this, and I think we're both probably shocked that we haven't seen a Flames deal um, come out before the Olympics yet. You, I know you and I had talked last week that we were both really expecting a big Flames move to happen. We thought Cammy would probably move by now. Yeah, that, it's one of those strange things. Like, even around the league, there hasn't really been any big deals. The only trade today was Pierre-Marc Bouchard and Peter Region for a fourth-round pick. So, like, you know, that's not really even a notable pick or trade in any way, shape, or form. So, you know. There's been a lot of trade speculation over the last couple of days with a lot of teams. Yeah, but nothing Nothing confirmed. that's actually been put to paper. It's just a little strange, because usually in any given year, by this point, usually there's two or three big trades that have already happened. Well, I think this year's a little bit different, because really we're like a week and a half away from trade deadline, but we have that two-week break in there, and I think maybe NHL GMs have their mind elsewhere, especially the ones that are going to Sochi, but yeah, normally if, if we were, you know, actually a week in calendar time away from the trade deadline, that's generally when you get the first blockbuster. It's just a little weird, though. Like, even at the, the last Olympics, like, there was a few trades before the Olympics. Like, you know, it was just basically, you know, your fourth liner types that were actually traded on the deadline like all the moves were made prior to the olympics so it's a little weird this time nothing yeah it is the only thing i can think of is teams still have to pay the players over the olympic break so maybe there's some teams that don't want to take on big salaries and pay them to sit around for two weeks yeah well plus that does factor in the cap hit as well so yeah that's true you know uh it's just weird. There's With the whole salary cap now, there's much more of a business to hockey as far as who you take and when you take them than there was before. Yeah. Before, it was just like, oh, does this player, will it make our team better? Okay. Yeah. Um, I imagine there's whole guys who are probably employed by every team just to tell you when to take a certain player. We can't take them Tuesday. we got to take them Thursday, that sort of thing. But, yeah, no, I'm surprised, and um, I'm not sure what time the actual roster freeze is on Friday, if it's right after midnight or if it's, you know, at noon, like the trade deadline, but I wouldn't be surprised to see at least one trade, maybe not the Flames, but I wouldn't be surprised to see one trade of some note sneak through before the trade deadline. Or not the trade deadline, the uh, roster freeze. It's one of those fun things, wait and see. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, and it's maybe a little bit of a, I mean, it's going to be a better story for Calgary Media having these guys around for a couple more weeks but maybe it's a good thing it'll you know let them rest up and let the gms talk things over when they're in sochi for the olympics and make sure that you know what they what they're doing is what they want to do so i think if you have the chance to step back and look at your team when you're perhaps not with them every day it gives you a little bit more of an objective view as well oh definitely it's just you know anxious uh 
see some trades happening. Well, I said, you know, and, like, and I think as <laughs> Flames fans, especially with last year, we saw a lot of movement around this time. I mean, we saw, you know, the Bo Meester deal. We saw the Aginla deal. We saw the rumored Kipper deal to Toronto. So I think we are almost looking at last year going, okay, when are things going to start happening? Because this is when everything started happening. Well, it'll be exciting to see who, what, where, you know, and when. <laughs> yeah, we know something's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. And, you know, tomorrow, if, you know, after the show is recorded, if a Flames deal does happen, we'll have a little segment in here thrown in. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about it. And Matt and I haven't figured out what we're going to do yet, but we do plan to broadcast at least once over the Olympics. So watch the website, uh, watch our social media, and you'll find out when we're going to be on next. Um, Anything else you want to chat about? Uh, not particularly. The Flames didn't look too bad the last week. So, you know, I have nothing really to rant on. It's been a so, good week for the Flames. I mean, they're, what, uh, five in the last six games now? For uh, wins? Six out of seven. Six out of seven. So that's pretty good. So, I mean, for a team that's been a, a cellar dweller all year, they're finally getting on a roll, which is great to see. Yeah. And we'll we'll see if I doubt they'll be able. I think they'll probably be able to continue it in Philly tomorrow. I think we're expecting a good game in Philly, whether we win it or not. I'm expecting that to be a, a good game to watch. Yeah, and a nice long break, and you know, hopefully after the break they can keep on the roll. Exactly. Well, then I guess it's time for tonight's main event. We're really pleased to have Rico Fata. The Flames' first round draft pick in 1998, 6th overall, the last guy to go 6th overall before Sean Monaghan on our show tonight to do an interview with us for our Old Flames segment. We'll catch up on Rico and talk about his career, the current Flames, and much more. That'll be an interesting interview. Definitely must hear radio. All right, this is Dan Stevenson for Fireside Chat, and we're here with Rico Fata today. Rico, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Rico Fata was the Calgary Flames' first round, sixth overall selection in the 1998 entry draft. He was tied with Daniel Kachuk at the time for the Flames' highest draft picks in history, and now Sean Monaghan joins them as another sixth overall pick for the Flames. Rico, as we look forward to the NHL's Olympic break, you never did get to represent Team Canada for the men's senior tournament. You did play in the World Juniors and represent Canada, and you also played several times in the Spangler Cup. How does the prestige of representing Canada in the Spangler Cup compare to that of the World Juniors or the senior men's Olympic team? Well, any time that you're putting on the Canadian, you know, the Maple Leafs, the Canadian flag on your chest, it's a great experience. You know, I had the opportunity to play at the World Juniors. The, the Calgary Flames gave me the opportunity when I was 18 years old to go to the World Juniors, and it was a great experience. Also playing at the Spangler Cup, I was there four or five times, and it was, it was truly a great experience. Um, it's The stage is quite big. You know, there's a lot of people watching back home, so I uh, gave everybody an opportunity for, you know, a guy like myself and other people that have been over in Europe for quite a long time that parents and friends, friends and family can see you on TV. So it was really cool. It's definitely an honor to put that jersey on. Speaking of the Spangler Cup, what would you say was the biggest difference you found between playing hockey in the NHL and playing pro hockey in Europe? Um, I mean, the speed of the game over in Europe is very comparable to the NHL. It's it's very fast, especially in Switzerland. You know, I was over there for six years, so um, you know, it's a great league. It still is a great league. Uh, there's some really good leagues out there in Sweden, Finland, and uh, I was just recently in Finland. It's a little bit different style of hockey in Finland, but uh, all in all, good hockey players. It's a now universal game. It's not just, uh, you know, as Canadians were very biased, but it's not a, just a Canadian game anymore. You know, it's a, it's a worldwide universal game now. So the leagues over there are super good, super skilled, and uh, very comparable to the NHL for sure. So you think someone who's playing pro hockey in Europe could still play a very competitive and exciting brand of hockey? Absolutely, 100%. I mean, a lot of people think, you know, you're going over to Europe to play, that it's not the, you know, the best of leagues to play in and that sort of thing. You obviously want to play in the NHL. That's your goal, and that's your, as a kid growing up as a Canadian, you want to play in the NHL. And 
if you don't have that opportunity, being over in Europe is a great opportunity for friends, family, and whoever else to see the world and, and enjoy that aspect of life. And it's a different lifestyle over there. And the hockey is uh, the hockey's quite good. It's very good. If uh, somebody does get an opportunity to watch a few games and stream them live over in Europe, uh, I'd be very, very impressed with the, uh, the uh, competitiveness and the, and the style of the games. Awesome. So, Rico, you were uh, traded yourself during your career from the Penguins to the Rangers in a big eight-player deal in, 2003. in 2003. Right now, we're close to the NHL trade deadline, and we're wondering if you could tell us how, as a player, it feels to be traded. What is that process that you go through on that day that you've been traded? Well, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a mixed emotions type of feeling that you're getting. You know, one, you're, you're, you're feeling not wanted. Uh, because you've been traded and then you're feeling wanted in the same time because another team does want you. So, you know, you feel a little bit of uh, mixed emotions. Uh, you know, you have to leave friends. You're going to have to leave your teammates that you played with. Uh, in my situation, you know, I was traded from the Rangers into uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins. And um, I was really starting to find my niche in New York. I was starting to play really well. I was starting to get more ice time. Uh, the coach. Yeah, you had a couple good seasons. Yeah, there. things were starting to go well. I scored my first NHL goal with the New York Rangers. So, you know, it was such a great experience there. You know, you have ties to the city. You know what you're doing. It's a big city. You know your ins and outs. And all of a sudden, you know, you make friends you know, with your teammates, and then you're getting traded. So, you know, you got to uproot your whole life, and then you got to leave, and you got to go uh, to another city. You know, you know, guys with families and kids. You know, that's uh, that's a whole new ball game. At the time when I got traded, I never had kids. I did have a wife, but I didn't have kids. But um, you know, it's 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 definitely a mixed emotion thing. It's it's some players take it better than others. I mean, for me, it was I knew it was going to be a good opportunity because Pittsburgh was going through a rebuilding phase, and I knew that I was getting going to get a little bit more ice time. So I took it in a real positive way, and it was. You know, the drive from Pitts, from New York to Pittsburgh was quite long, thinking about a lot of mixed emotions. But when I got to Pittsburgh, I spent three years there, and I had that's probably the best uh, part of my career was in Pittsburgh. So when you get told that you've been traded, I imagine you get called to the general manager's office. What's going through, like, who's the first person you feel like you need to call after that? Is it your wife? Oh, yeah, I called my wife right away. The first person I called was my wife, and I told her I was been traded. Um, and she was, you know, a little bit, uh, shocked at the time. Second people I called were my parents. Um, you know, then I called friends and family, obviously after that on that seven and eight hour drive from the, from the time uh, we left uh, New York to, to Pittsburgh. So, I mean, it was, like I said, it was mixed emotions. It was, it was, uh, you know, going to a new team, you know, going to new players, you played against the guys, but you don't know them personally. So you're walking into a new whole new atmosphere. You gotta, you gotta sell yourself as a person, you know, you gotta be yourself obviously in the first, first breath but in the second breath you know you want to uh create a good atmosphere for yourself for the, for people around you and, and gain the respect of the players that are already on that team right so it's it's definitely a difficult thing in life especially for guys that had that have kids that are traded you know kids have to change go to different schools change cities and that sort of thing it's it's not the whole glamorous uh, thing that everybody thinks it could be was it weird for you the first time that you were wearing a Penguins jersey and had to play the Rangers again? Oh, for sure it was. It was really difficult because, I mean, I played at an era where there was, uh, you know, Eric Lindros was there, Sandy McCarthy was there, Brian Leach was there, uh, Pavel Burry was there, Peter Nedved, Mark Messier. You know, I grew up idolizing all these guys, and I was got a chance to play with them, start to get to know them as people, and then all of a sudden I'm on the other side, you know, and I got to hit them and play against them and play hard. So, you know, it was difficult the first time going back into Madison Square Garden after playing, you know, with the Penguins. But then after a few years, you know, you get used to it and you, you, uh, you know, you realize you're not playing for the Rangers anymore. You're actually playing for the Penguins. So it's, it's difficult at times, you know, especially when you're for guys that play longer periods of time, like you're six, seven, eight years in one place and then get traded. I'm sure it's very difficult for those type of players. That's part of the NHL lifestyle. That's part of what you signed up for, right? That's absolutely. That's what you sign up for. You know that, uh, you know, to put it bluntly, you're, you're a piece of meat, you know, that's just the way it works. You know, they're, they're running a business and if you're not performing or if you're, if you're performing really well, somebody else might want you and make a trade for you and, you know, pay you extra or whatever it may be. So that's just part of the business. You know, hockey is definitely first and foremost a fun game, but in the end, uh, it's a business and it's a huge business. It's a billion dollar the, business. There's a lot of money in that, in that league. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. You're talking, you know, billionaires are employing millionaires. That's that's the way I kind of look at it. So 
I mean, in the end, it's it's a huge business and there's a huge money market for, for hockey. So talking about the NHL lifestyle, what's one thing you don't think the fans fully appreciate about NHL players and their lifestyle or something that took you a while to adjust to when you turned pro? Well, I was 18, so I was pretty young. I mean, mentally-wise, I was pretty young, you know, when I came into the camp in Calgary. Like, physically, you know, I was I was definitely ready to play in the NHL. Um, mentally, probably not. I mean, uh, you're hanging out with men. You're hanging out with men, with, with, with kids. Some of those kids are 10, 11, 12 years old, and you're an 18, 19-year-old kid just coming in, and that's exactly what I was. Um, the whole glamorous part of the lifestyle is, you know, you get to travel, you get to – you know, jumping on chartered planes and plain food and, you know, staying in nice hotels and that sort of thing. But there's not much of a life. I mean, you're, you're going out, you're playing constantly. Your, your body is your temple. Your body is your money makers, right? So, you know, you got to keep that in top shape. So you're constantly, you know, striving to be better and you're constantly practicing. You're on the ice every day. You know, when you get that day off, it's basically your feet are up and you're watching TV and you're just resting the body. So, I mean, guys with kids, it's obviously different. They're up earlier, taking the kids to school, to the rink, and then home, and then different places. So, you know, the lifestyle is great, definitely a lot of traveling, but you don't have much of a life during the year. And that's why you see a lot of the guys in the summertime really enjoying themselves and enjoying the boat, enjoying their swimming and, you know, golfing and that sort of thing because they don't get a chance to do that during the year. Yeah, you got to take your leisure time when you can get it, right? Exactly. That's exactly what I used to do. And as soon as I came home, the first thing that my wife and I did was we take the kids and we go on a vacation together. That's exactly just clear our mind from the year, detox my body and just relax, put my feet up and, and you know, and enjoy my enjoy your family time and just uh, and basically just chill out. Makes a lot of sense. So Rico, you ended up playing for the current Calgary Flames head coach, Bob Hartley, when you were in Atlanta, correct? Yes, I was. What can you tell us about Bob Hartley as a coach? He, this is his first year here, so we're trying to figure him out as fans ourselves. Bob's a, um, he's a real, he's a really good X's and O's guy. He's really, um, you know, he understands the game really well. He understands uh, what each player can bring to the table. And I think he motivates each player in different ways. So he kind of figures out what each, each player needs to be motivated. You know, say a player like a Matt Stage, and he may need, um, you know, the coach to light a fire under, under, his, uh, under his bum, or he may be a guy that just needs to have video and talking and sitting down and uh, analyzing his clips. He's a really good coach. I really is. He's very demanding. Um, you know, he's, he helped me out quite a bit when I was in Atlanta, we did video and stuff together. Uh, I was the type of player that every once in a while needed a kick in the ass. So he knew that and he, he knew that I could handle it and I was strong enough to do it. So he would do it to me. So he's a good coach. He really is. I have, all good things to say about Bob. You think he's a good coach for a rebuild? I think so. I really do. I mean, you look at uh, you look at your first round pick. Uh, uh, I believe it's Mon- Sean Monahan. Monahan. He's been doing great. I've been following him. He's a six overall pick. He's been doing fantastic. And I think Bob has kind of let him play his game, but he's also, you know, he's teaching him how to play defense as well. So, you know, in order to play in the NHL nowadays, you can't be just one dimensional one dimensional player. You know, you can't be just. Uh, a 50 goal scorer and, and a minus 20 on your team anymore. You got to be able to play defense. The game's too fast nowadays. So you got to be a complete player, no matter who you are, even if you're a superstar. Looking at guys like Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves, those guys are back checking just as hard as they're going up the ice too. So, you know, I think Bob is. I think if they stick with him, um, I think that definitely the Flames, if they can add, you know, you know, a real top end high goal scoring guy and a real good playmaker. I think the Flames could be really uh, an energetic and a pretty, uh, pretty tough team to play against. Do you still watch much Flames hockey? Uh, if I'm not up, if I'm not sleeping by that point, because I'm two hours ahead. But yeah, I still watch. I mean, I get CBC. I like to watch Calgary. I mean, I get a chance. I just watched them the other night against Minnesota, and then I watched them um, the other night too. So I mean, I'm, I, I keep it up as much as I can. I mean, I'm quite busy with my three kids at home and my hockey schools and whatnot. So. I mean, nine, eleven o'clock rolls around. I'm kind of eyes are falling asleep. So, as a former sixth overall pick yourself, do you have any advice for Sean Monahan? Anything that you would impart on another sixth overall pick? Uh, I think I, I think I would just basically just tell him to keep on doing what he's doing. Like I think he's doing great. I mean, I think he's shooting the puck. He's he's selfish when he's supposed to be selfish. He's passing when he's supposed to pass. So. That was the biggest thing for me when I came in. I was I was in I was intimidated, and it looks like he's not intimidated, and that's something that you can't teach people. So, 
as a to my advice from him to him is you know don't be intimidated and just keep going and, and, and strive to be better and don't worry who's in your way and just go through. I mean, that was for me that I, I never, I was intimidated. I grew up watching these players and all of a sudden I'm in Calgary and I was intimidated. I was playing alongside Jerome McGinley and Darren Fleury and Steve Smith and, you know, Jason Weimer. I just watched these guys on TV as of last year. And all of a sudden I'm there playing on the same line as them. So my timid, it's gonna be crazy. It was crazy for me, and I, I, I had a tough time grasping onto it. So, I think that's why. I mean, I think I would have been a little bit more successful if I was a little bit more assertive of myself. And that's the only thing I would tell him. I think just be assertive of yourself and be confident in your ability, and just keep going with it. And he's doing great. Awesome. Well, Rico, uh, hockey fans love to hear great road stories. Do you have a road story you could share with us? I'm sure I got a few for you. I remember a few times when we played for the Pittsburgh Penguins. I had. We had a really young team, Matt Bradley, Brooks Orpik, who's still there, uh, Sidney Crosby, myself, uh, Matt Murley. Um, that is a young team, yeah. Yeah, we had Rick Jackman and Morozov. We had a really young team, so we were all hanging out with each other quite a bit. So we also used to play tricks on each other, so we used to steal each steal each other's socks so that nobody else can have their socks. So we'd go away on a road trip to Calgary or Edmonton, and it'd be minus 30 out, and we'd be stealing each other's socks, sneaking each other's rooms so nobody had socks. So everybody wow. would be running to the mall having to go get their socks. So I remember I stole a couple of guys' socks at the end of the year. I presented them with like 35 socks and told them that was a <laughs> present for them. Wow. So it was pretty cool. Those are just one little story. Those are fun things I go along playing in the NHL. Those are great bonding experiences as a team too, right? No, it's fun. I mean, if you're if you can't handle it, then you know the guys that can't handle it because they get a little bit. They're a little bit too intense. You know, I was one of those guys that would take it, take it, take it, and then get pissed and then you know, latch out in them. But, uh, over time you just learn to just roll with the punches and you just take it, take, uh, learn to have thick skin and, you know, cause dressing room sometimes could be, uh, could be pretty tough sometimes. Well, uh, Rico, before we let you go, I know that you're not playing pro hockey anymore, but now you're running your own hockey schools called fast by fat. Eye. can you tell us a little bit about your schools and what makes them different? Well, I mean, I'm not really, I'm not really reinventing the wheel or I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I mean, I got some, my own, my own drills and I got about, uh, so far I've, you know, created about eight or nine drills so far that are, you know, promoting and, and, ex, you know, getting the kids to accelerate through their stride, obviously fast. I mean, that's what I'm all about. I'm, I'm trying to get the kids to be faster with the puck and without a puck forwards and backwards skating. So, um, over my career, I've learned a lot, you know, from a lot of the other players that I played with watching them, older players, younger players. So, my school has done well in Sault Ste. Marie. It's a small town. We've got 75,000 people here. So um, I came home. I had an injury in Finland. I was playing over there this year. I had an injury, and uh, I decided for the best interest of my family because I wasn't playing, I thought we'd come home. So I jumped right into the whole hockey school thing, and I really enjoy what I'm doing. I like it, and you know, the kids have been really, uh, really, um, you know, grasping onto the concept that I've been saying. So, you know, I got What age range do you teach? I got all different age groups. I'm going to do stuff in the summertime from ages 6 to 8 all the way up to uh, to 17, 18. So, I mean, my oh, age cool. groups are going to vary. So I want to diversify myself to know that I can do all different types of age groups, so whether it's skating for young kids or puck handling for 14, 15-year-olds, one-on-ones for 17, 18-year-olds. So I like to diversify myself into that. So A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything and that sort of thing. But I, my main focus is speed. My main focus is teaching the kids how to get faster in a proper stride, obviously, in that sense. So, I mean, it's on uh, my website, and I have some YouTube videos on there. Like I said, I'm not in reinventing the wheel or anything, but a lot of the drills are, are quite competitive and quite difficult uh, for the kids. And you know what? Now the kids are uh, really grasping onto my concepts. That's good. So somebody was interested in more information on the school, what web should, should they go to? They can go to fastbyfata.com. There's two different types of websites. There's uh, the desktop website, and there's also my uh, my uh, mobile-friendly with cell phones, so iPhones and um, Google and, and uh, Android. So uh, two different types of websites. There's my all my videos on there, uh, YouTube pages on there, and contact information. So, I mean, I'm starting to brand off a little bit of Northern Ontario a little bit. I've got three or four teams uh, about an hour away from here. So I'm definitely interested in traveling and doing that thing and offering my program, um, thinking about branding the program and maybe coming in and, offering my program to different teams and you know they can purchase my program booklet dvd that sort of thing come in run a few days show them what my drills are all about and then you know i can wash my hands of it and then everybody can kind of brand in the fast by fat program 
That's a cool idea. Yeah, so it's my brother's idea, actually, not mine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that's what brothers are for, right? They're yeah, good exactly. for throwing ideas around with. Exactly, exactly. I think it's a great idea. I'm starting to cut up a lot of my videos so far. I mean, I got about 20, 25 minutes of footage so far. Uh, probably before I start branding this, I'd like to have at least 45 minutes to an hour of videos and ex explanation, and, and I've been writing down all my drills. So that's something that I'd like to you know, brand into something, you know, if coaches and teams are interested, they can get in contact with me and uh, I can put something together for them, of course, with a cost. And then if they're definitely interested, you know, get me out there, let me run a few days, show the kids what we're doing, show the coaches what I'm doing, kind of put on the clinic. And then if they decide that they uh, want to run with it, then they can purchase my program. You know, they can purchase the fast, fast by fat program. Awesome. Yeah, and I know we have a lot of minor hockey coaches that listen to Fireside Chats, so if any of you are out there and want something new to try with your team, uh, go to fastbyfata.com and get a hold of Rico. Great, that's awesome. If they do, just uh, my, my mobile number's on there, my cell phone's number, my email address is there, so get in contact with me if you guys want more information. It's going to be in sometime in the future. It's, it's in its works. Uh, I'm just starting to kind of, you know, I've only been at it for three months, but this is something that I'd like to brand off. Um, you know, I'm always going to need so some get help. in on the ground floor. It's on the ground. It's coming. It's, you know, it's in its, it's in its basic stage right now, but eventually, you know, there'll be volume one then volume two, volume three, that, you know, that sort of thing. As I'm getting more kids and as I'm getting more comfortable with what I'm doing. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today, Rico. Good stuff. Well, thanks. I appreciate how I appreciate all this. It's great. Y yeah, no problem. Thanks for joining us. And it was good to catch up with you. Great. Have a good one. Thanks. You too. Thanks so much to Rico Fata for taking some time out of his day to talk to us. Hopefully we can have him on the show again in the future. Catch up with what's going on with Fast by Fata, how he's making out with getting his materials online, and also ask him some more fan questions. And thanks to all the fans who gave us some questions to ask Rico through social media and through our website. If you're a coach parent, or just a player who's looking to up your game, make sure you get a hold of Rico. Go to fastbyfata.com, and there you can get a hold of Rico, and let him know you heard about him here on Fireside Chat. We're going to be taking a week or so off for the Olympics, but we will be back probably near the end of the Olympics to do a final Olympic wrap-up, so make sure that you're um, following our website, you subscribe to our feed online at firesidechat.ca, that you follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash firesidechat. Uh, on Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast. You can subscribe to us through iTunes, and if you do, please make sure that you leave a review so that other people know about our show. Or you can find us through Stitcher, and we'll let you know through all of those methods when we'll be back on the air next. We hope that everybody enjoys watching the Olympic hockey. It's some of the best hockey in the world, and we only get it every four years. And of course, go Canada. Let's see if Canada can come home with some hardware this year. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. Oh, we are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're looking for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.